right, let me continue with a closer description of the scheduler and uh, the two modes of operation. The first one I'd like to touch is uh, the cooperative multitasking. The cooperative multitasking uh, is uh, a little bit special in the fact that it requires a cooperation between different tasks or between all tasks. So each task has to give up to be able to allow other tasks to run. This requires that the task gets, for example, blocked by calling a function that blocks it by waiting for something, being it a timeout or some other object. Or it can get to a ready state by calling, for example, OS thread yield, and it can be as well put to suspend mode by the system, typically other task, or it can as well suspend itself. Uh, one uh, advantage uh, is that the tasks are not preemptive by tasks with a higher priority. So you get all the time you need to finish your own job. Then there is not implemented a time slicing. So the tasks don't switch periodically based on a time base. And uh, to allow it, you have to disable the preemption in the FreeRTOS uh, config. When we choose a preemptive multitasking, the situation changes a little bit. So uh, the preemptive multitasking works with the tasks, especially if they have the same priority. So the FreeRTOS always chooses the task with the highest priority, but if there are more tasks with the same highest priority, it will switch between them with a round robin algorithm. So in this case, the context, uh, the task switch happens when uh, there is a time slice that passes, which can be a millisecond uh, or a longer time defined by the uh, global system frequency. Uh, then when uh, the task with a higher priority uh, has uh, become ready, when the task gets blocked or when the task gets ready by yielding. The preemption is enabled by a use preemption a macro set to one. So this way, uh, the behavior of the operating system becomes uh, a little bit more uh, human friendly because uh, all the tasks with the same priority get scheduled after a time slice. So there is a feeling that all of them run faster, even if it mo uh, this may not be exactly the same thing. Why I don't use preemptive multitasking too much? Uh, you have to think about the fact that uh, the time slice happens in an interrupt. So the task switch can happen anytime during your application runtime. Which means if you use uh, non-recursive functions and uh, a lot of uh, CRTL functions are not reentrant, you may have a trouble. For example, printf, the typical case, uh, typ typical function, is not a reentrant function because it uses some uh, internal uh, variables of the CRTL library. And if you uh, interrupt it in the middle by an interrupt and you give uh, a job to another task that as well uses printf, then it starts uh, overwriting the internal variables <coughs> and uh, it becomes non-consistent and it can as well crash your application. So be careful about uh, using uh, non-reentrant functions and uh, this you will typically learn in the documentation for uh, the compiler and its libraries. So if it's described whether it's reentrant or not, it uh, helps you whether to use it or not. If you don't have any information about it, then I discourage you from using preemptive. Uh, there is as well a possibility uh, to use the uh, cooperative with preemption by IRQ, which means that uh, still the tasks which normally happens when uh, uh, you have, uh, you give up your CPU time, but the tasks which can happen as well when you get an external interrupt and at the end of the interrupt, 
you wake up some higher priority task and then this causes the task switch. So at that moment, uh, the interrupts are used to trigger the context switch and it can force a higher priority inter uh, task to execute instead of the original one. So it's a preemptive system without time slicing. The scheduler is uh, a way how to switch the tasks and to define under which priorities the tasks will switch. So it's typically triggered by the pendable SV and uh, it scans all the tasks that are in the ready state and chooses the one with the highest priority. If the priority is equal among uh, other tasks, then it goes in a round robin. In FreeRTOS, round robin is implemented for the tasks with the same priority. Now let's talk a little bit more about the interrupts and connection to the hardware. So when we look uh, in the interrupts, uh, you can see how uh, the interrupts cooperate together. The system service interrupt uh, is uh, raised by an SWI instruction and it's used only once to start the scheduler at a high priority. So you can see that uh, the SVC occurs only at the beginning of the free RTOS execution and as soon as it's uh, finished, it uh, provides the task switch and the first tasks execute. Then we have got a SysTick interrupt that has a lowest priority of all the interrupts used by the FreeRTOS and it is used uh, for defining a task switch on the defined tick rate uh, related or expressed in Hertz. Uh, the SysTick, if uh, the preemptive uh, operation is defined, calls the task switch, which means it sets the flag for pendable system interrupt, if the context switch is necessary. And finally, the pendable SV interrupt uh, is uh, finally used for a task switch. And uh, it's typically called from the SysTick and it is as well set in functions uh, of the RTOS API to guarantee the context switch whenever we change a state of the task. So if, uh, for example, we enter a blocking state, if we enter a ready state, in all these situations, the context switch is generated. Now let's look at the priority of the interrupts. The interrupts are selected or uh, differentiated by the fact that you either call the RTOS functions or not. If we look at the RTOS related interrupts, they are defined on the lowest priority. Then the interrupts uh, within the RTOS space, so those where, for example, you get a character from the UART and you put it into the free RTOS queue, they have to be, or they are limited in the priority below the syscall interrupt priority. So all interrupts with the relation to the FreeRTOS have to be run below the maximum syscall interrupt priority. This is to guarantee that the FreeRTOS will always have the option to take over using uh, system routines. If you look in the Cubemix uh, interrupt definition and you enable the FreeRTOS, it will give you the option to check mark if the interrupt calls the RTOS functions or not. If yes, it is limited to the RTOS interrupt priorities. If you declare that it doesn't use the RTOS functions, you are free to choose higher priorities, which means you can define a very fast peripheral response time if you don't use the RTOS functions. Speaking about the IRQ, when uh, we operate uh, with interrupts, we need to use specific functions. Uh, these functions typically have uh, a suffix from ISR. They are different a little bit from the standard functions used among the tasks because they can as well uh, pass a context or a calling task. So this differentiation has to be done if you use native API by a programmer. 
If, however, you use a CMSYS API, this differentiation is done by the CMSYS function. And uh, for example, in the case of OS semaphore release, you don't need to care which function you call, there is just one. And it internally differentiates whether it calls from the interrupt or from a standard task. You can as well see the API functions used in the native API from interrupts and the CMC's OS API. So all the functions for the native API have the suffix from ISR. The CMC's OS APIs don't care. Now let's look at the boot time of uh, an application running on RTOS. There are things that are dependent on the hardware and uh, they allow you to tweak the startup. So what is hardware dependent? The CPU clocks. Cubemix sets the CPU clocks in a main routine. But uh, if you need a very fast application startup time, what can you do? Where you can tweak your CPU clock if you need a very fast startup time. Do you know function system in it? It is the very first function called after the reset. In our library, it's defined to reset the oscillators and to run from the standard internal RC oscillator. So it guarantees a safe and reliable startup. However, if uh, you have a crystal connected and uh, you have a very big memory to initialize, it's probably better to start with uh, boosting your clocks, turning on the PLL and starting on the PLL because then the memory initialization, copying of the blocks, uh, initializing the uh, init values of variables and so on, will be much faster. So the first way is to move the clock initialization from the main to the system init. Then the RTL library uh, will initialize the variables. So it will uh, take the init values for the static and global variables. Uh, it will as well uh, clear the static and global variables uh, without initialization value. So it's a lot of mem set and mem copy. And uh, then if there is any other setup needed, for example, for C++, then it will as well call the static constructors of the classes. And uh, it can as well initialize stack, heap, and other things. And uh, only then you get into your main routine and in the main routine, you set up uh, your main task and any others if needed. Then you set up the queues, mutexes, timers, and so on. And you start the scheduler. From that point, you can see how much time it needs. So per uh, one object, it takes approximately 500 CPU cycles. Uh, the application task uh, needs uh, uh, more than 1000 cycles to create. And the initial uh, scheduler start takes approximately 1200 cycles. So if you sum all this, you get a startup time when you get first context switch and you launch your application, your first task. So sometimes it's beneficial if you uh, start the scheduler very quickly, you just create your init task, launch the scheduler, and then uh, while uh, you define other tasks, you can initialize the peripherals and the other tasks later. So the primary tasks that are needed to execute very quickly can be defined, uh, for example, in preemptive uh, mode, and uh, they can already run while you initialize further peripherals. So you have got a possibility to create tasks that uh, wait for a peripheral initialization and only when a peripheral is initialized, especially if it relies on some external things like connecting the Ethernet cable or detecting the Ethernet cable. Uh, such tasks can be created uh, very quickly at the beginning, but then it can be launched when the cable is uh, physically connected. So you then speed up the response. Further, the RTOS defines an idle task. This is a special one. It's uh, implemented for the sake of having at least one active task that will run if nothing else is available. It's created automatically by the kernel 
the idle task has uh, one interesting thing. You can uh, create an idle hook, which then gets called whenever idle task starts. Uh, this way, uh, you can implement low power mode, because if the microcontroller has no other task to be scheduled, which means uh, it doesn't need to do anything, then this idle call or idle hook allows you to put the microcontroller in a low power, in a sleep or stop mode. If you use the tickless idle, you have to do a couple of other things, like stopping the time base, like defining the wake up interrupts and so on. But it allows you to disable the periodic wake up of the microcontroller from a time base interrupt. Additionally, uh, implementing the entry and exit macros or uh, hooks in the idle allow you to uh, calculate the CPU idle time. So it can tell you how much the CPU is loaded. This is all the counters. Now I'm running at 30% free time. Now I'm running at 0% free time or 99% free time. This is because we can measure at which time we entered the idle and when we exited the idle. FreeRTOS is started by calling the OS kernel start in a typically main.c file. So when you initialize at least uh, one task, you call the OS kernel start and uh, as soon as you enter it, it starts scheduling the tasks. Normally, uh, it calls the vtask start scheduler from the native API and uh, then it should never return. So when uh, this is uh, called, it calls the uh, task create for idle task. It as well uh, sets up the timer task if uh, you opted for it. And then it calls the export start scheduler, which generates a first context switch and chooses the first active task to be running. The port start first task then uh, locates uh, the stack, sets the MSP and PSP, and it triggers the software interrupt, which calls the SVC handler. And uh, this one restores the context, loads the TCB from the first task that you have implemented, and starts execu executing this task. So you can see that it's a series of uh, uh, different jobs to do before you start your first one, but it all makes uh, very clear sense. I would say that uh, all behavior of uh, the FreeRTOS is based on lists. If you create a queue, it's a list of items. If you create a semaphore or a mutex, it's a list with a one element. So uh, most of the functionality in the FreeRTOS is different lists. So uh, there exists a possibility to instantiate a list and a uh, lot of lists are as well used internally in the kernel. When we look at them, you normally don't get access to these lists. But uh, in case you want to debug you can still put them in a watch window and you can traverse them through. So uh, we can see that uh, there is a ready task list that uh, lists all the tasks or pointers to the TCB for the tasks that can be instantiated and uh, put into the running state. So task list is an array with a size of maximum priorities because it lists the tasks uh, depending on their priority. If you define a specific priority, it will be put in the appropriate element of the task list array. Probably one interesting information, you can change the priority of the task in runtime, and that means it will be moved between the ready lists. Further, if you terminate a task, it will be put uh, into the list tasks waiting termination until they are removed, Further, there is a suspended task list, uh, pending ready task list, uh, where uh, it is put after you, for example, send a message to the task. So it's put from the blocked state to the pending ready, 
and then the scheduler will put it into the appropriate priority ready list. You have got a delayed task list where the tasks wait for a specific timeout. So with each time base, uh, the waiting uh, time for these tasks is decremented. And when it reaches zero, it gets into the pending ready. So that the task that's waiting for something has elapsed its waiting time. So we can use it again. And uh, we have got as well overflow delayed task list that uh, overflowed the current tick time. That's how the Friartos organizes different tasks in different states. Speaking about the kernel start, we already uh, discussed that on the previous slides. But uh, uh, the API offered the functionality to end the scheduler. It's not implemented on STM32, so we cannot finish the Friartos, which means we never exit from the OS kernel start. Further, we can check if the kernel is running or not. This is a very important thing, especially if you, for example, implement lock functions. So if you print something on a UART, like error messages, status messages, and so on, and uh, this function formats the output and sends it. Uh, when uh, you, for example, use this functionality before you start the scheduler, for example, during peripheral initialization and different stacks initialization, such function, if it uses, uh, for example, a queue for the messages, can uh, use the operating system functions if the kernel is running. But if you run the log function before you start the kernel, it must use a different method of synchronizing the messages and sending of the data. So for example, if the kernel is not running, you will use a blocking function for sending uh, the data over UART. But if the kernel is running, you can use a DMA and uh, some task that takes care about the messages from the queue. And you can create dynamically the space for the text. You can send it through the queue to the sending task. And then it's more efficient because you don't need to wait for the DMA transaction to finish. So the function OS kernel running is a very important one when you uh, need to create a cooperation between non-RTOS and RTOS functionality. And you can as well read the value of the kernel sysTick where it's implemented as a 32-bit counter internally and it's used for timing but you can as well uh, use it to monitor how long your application is alive. Be careful when you implement uh, support for tickless mode in low power modes, the kernel sysTick is not incremented while the microcontroller sleeps. So when you wake up, if you need this time to be rather precise, you have to maintain the time separately and you have to update the internal time. Let's get to the tasks. We already saw uh, what a task is. It is a C function. The C function uh, has got some initialization code and then it runs in a never ending loop. Uh, you can see the prototype of the task. It's a void task because it never returns. It doesn't have any place where to return. And it gets a uh, argument that's a void constant pointer. So you can pass any pointer to anything. Typically it's uh, an initialization value. Uh, it can be a number typecasted to a void pointer, or it can be a pointer to a structure. Very often it's null. But uh, if you, for example, instantiate several tasks uh, using the same function, this typically gives them an idea uh, which task it is. So it can be a different TCP IP port. It can be the number of the task if it matters for debugging purposes or for communication purposes. 
So the argument is the initial argument uh, that's called when you create the task. And uh, when it's executed, it gets passed as an argument. Each task has uh, its own stack, priority, state where it can reside. And uh, it is created by a function OS thread create. And it's uh, deleted if you call OS thread delete. Which means uh, if you have a task for one purpose, you can uh, instantiate it, it gets executed, and it can delete itself. When all the initialization is finished, why should I keep it in the memory and in the lists? I just remove it and uh, it's never scheduled again. Task consists of a couple of elements. The first one is the program code. When you create a task, you put a name of the function of the task into the, its definition. So it's a pointer where the scheduler should jump when it uh, starts this task. And it calls the code of the task, the routine, and that's why we need it in a memory. Then it contains the stack where it uh, holds its local variables. And it has got the TCB where FreeRTOS stores the data, the context, and the state of this task. A uh, very interesting thing, the TCB, you don't get a pointer to it. What you get pointer to is the top of the stack. So if you want to see the TCB, you have to take this pointer, the original pointer, and decrement it by size of the TCB. Because the TCB is below. Uh, when you create a, a task, uh, PV port malloc is uh, called, and uh, it creates in the FreeRTOS heap, the space for the stack and for the TCB. So the first uh, creates the TCB, second uh, allocates the task stack, and uh, both values are saved in the TCB itself. When you do a switch from one task to the other, it's called context switching, and effectively the context, the registers, are stored in the TCB, and the new task restores the registers from its own TCB and then it's switched to. And here you can see an example of a task function. So we define it as a void function because we don't expect any return. A name of the task with a prototype for the argument. Then we can uh, run an initialization code. For example, if uh, this one is uh, responsible for uh, speaking to the Bluetooth Low Energy coprocessor, we can instantiate and initialize the UART. Then in the loop, we can care about the communication with the BLE. And uh, we should never get after the while one loop because uh, we don't have anywhere to return. So such block should not return anywhere. If you want to stop this task, you can suspend it or you can delete it, but never exit the function. We can see the uh, state machine, uh, how the tasks can uh, operate. So when they are created, they are created in a ready state. And uh, when uh, the scheduler decides to execute it, it uh, gets to the running state. And uh, from running, it can get again into the ready by yielding. And it can get as well to the blocked state by waiting for some resource or for a timeout. And it can be as well suspended. And effectively, it can be suspended from any of the other tasks. When it gets resumed, uh, it gets back to the ready state by OS thread resume. You can as well suspend all tasks if you want. And you can resume them by an interrupt. The thread state can be uh, obtained by CMC's function to get the state of the thread. And you can see that all can be decoded. The task priorities are defined as a number from zero to the max priorities minus one. And uh, the execution of the, each task is dependent on the priority. Remember that the number of priorities as well defines the number of the lists in the ready state. So the more priorities you define, the more memory it will request, which means limit the number of priorities only to the needed ones. The priority 
can be changed in runtime. So if you know that a task uh, that is normally dormant uh, will be needed in uh, the near future, you can boost its priority temporarily. And when the job is finished, you can reduce it again. So playing with priorities is a good trick how to increase temporarily importance of some communication or some process. And then you can again reduce the priority or you can put the task in a suspend. There exists some system defined priorities. You can see them like uh, starting with idle priority with a value minus three. Then we have got uh, low, below normal and normal priorities up to zero. And we can as well increase the priorities uh, up to the real time with a value three. Then of course you can uh, define your own set of priorities. There is as well a special value OS priority error. On this slide you can see how the two different strategies uh, cooperate among the tasks. So when the task switch occurs, when uh, the state of the tasks change. And you can see that uh, with the preemptive mode there is much more task switches so it takes uh, a little bit more CPU resources. You should remember that uh, the tasks are organized in the lists. The list uh, can be, or definition can be obtained in this header file. You can see what is uh, implemented inside each list. So there is a, a test value to validate whether the list is uh, not overwritten. Uh, we have got a priority, we have got a pointer to the sequential items. We have got a mini list item and uh, again an integrity value to test whether the list is fine and wasn't overwritten. When we speak about uh, the context switching, we can see step by step what happens when we get a source for the context switching uh, from the SysTick. First, we get a SysTick uh, interrupt that causes the execution of uh, export SysTick handler. This is implemented in port C and uh, it's normally written in assembly to be effective and it depends on the architecture. So for Cortex-M0 it will be different from Cortex-M3 or M4. Uh, this uh, interrupt handler will first disable all interrupts. This is uh, to block any other uh, system functions to interfere or interrupts to call any system functions. Then it activates the pendable SV bit so that at the end uh, we will execute the context switch when the SysTick handler is finished. When uh, the context switch will happen after we enable the interrupts again at the end of the function. Uh, the pandas v will call the task switch context and uh, this will call the macro select the highest priority task which goes through all the uh, listed ready in, uh, tasks and chooses the one with the highest priority put at the beginning of uh, a given list. Then when it is executed it's put at the end of the list. So it always rotates. So when the SysTick handler enables the interrupts again, the pendable SV is executed physically and the task switch occurs. So switching time uh, depends on uh, the interrupt latency and uh, on uh, Cortex-M is somehow fixed. So there were some test conditions like uh, it was compiled by Kyle for Cortex-M3. The stack overflow checking was turned off to show just the pure context switching. The compiler optimization was set for the speed. And uh, there was as well a macro port optimized task selection enabled. So with these uh, compilation setups, the task switch was measured and uh, it was uh, as well measured using the Cortex M4 and M7 that guarantees that the floating point registers are stored in the TCB and restored. So for measuring such time, 
we used the GPIO pins, so there are uh, GPIO outputs and event output. And uh, we used uh, these pins as output. And uh, see that uh, when uh, the PB6, okay, or to reset and set the PB6, we could use uh, these functions. If we want to see a pure glitch, so pure one CPU tick uh, output, we can use the send event assembly instruction. So this is well uh, differentiates because such function will delay the context switch by at least five to six clock cycles. This is a one clock cycle instruction. And when we run uh, the microcontroller with a four megahertz SysTick, we can see the time when one uh, task was finished and the other was entered. So by implementing this, we can measure the time and uh, we can see that the beginning of the SysTick and the beginning of the user task code took 65 microseconds. Now if you take 65 microseconds and we multiply by the system clock running at 4 megahertz, we can assume how long the task switch is. It's 4 times 65 microseconds four cycles per microsecond multiplied by 65 microseconds. And we can as well see a beginning of pent SV and the user task code. So this is where we uh, do the yield, for example, and uh, change or uh, generate the task switch uh, as quickly as possible, avoiding the SysTick. So in this case, the task switch took 37 microseconds. So this is the time generating context switch by a time uh, by a SysTick. This is a context switch by OS yield. So you see there is a difference which is the source of the context switch. And uh, if we use uh, the combined method beginning of SysTick and uh, jump to the pen SV 30 microseconds. That's time that's spent in the SysTick interrupt. And we can as well see jump to the user task within PenSV and user task code. So in this case, five microseconds. Now looking at uh, the possibility of uh, generating uh, pulses with an instruction, the SEV send event generates just one clock worth of output. But the advantage of such instruction is no other time spent. So now let's speak about the stack pointers. The Cortex-M architecture offers two stack pointers that are banked. Both of them are present as a register R13 and uh, the switch between them proceeds automatically. If you run in a dual stack model, that's uh, a initial setup of uh, the FreeRTOS, uh, the main stack pointer is used uh, when uh, you are in an interrupt or exception model. The process stack pointer, however, is used uh, whenever you run a standard application code. So if you are out of all interrupts. The advantage is that it allows separation of the core of the RTOS, which is pointed by the main stack pointer from different tasks which are pointed by a process stack pointer. So the stacks are independent and uh, uh, it minimizes the risk of overwriting the main uh, stack for the core of the operating system. The dual stack model has to be switched on and uh, it is the option for the free RTOS. Normally, when you boot the STM32, it starts with a single stack model. So only the MSP is used both for the standard application and the interrupts. But by turning on the dual stack, then uh, the two stacks will appear. Now let's jump to the API of creating of the tasks. So we can see how the task can be defined and then how it can be created. Uh, the task is defined by a macro OS thread def. Here we uh, put the name of the handler. Uh, the function 
that will be called when the task is instantiated, the priority, number of instances which is ignored right now, and the number of the uh, stack size currently in bytes. So the CMSYS API differs from the native API by definition of the stack size in bytes. Uh, I'd like to point out that this is a macro that creates a structure as a local variable with this name. So it adds some uh, prefix and suffix and they uses the task one as the uh, principal name of this structure. Further, uh, when uh, you want to create the task and uh, instantiate it in the heap and uh, put it into the scheduler, you call a function OS thread create. Now you can see that the task one is wrapped by a macro OS thread, which takes the task one, adds the prefix and the pointer. So effectively it passes the pointer to the local variable created in the OS thread dev. And the second parameter is the initialization value passed to the task when you create it. Uh, the creation of the task will return a thread ID and uh, you can store it in a handle that can be used when calling a thread related functions. So if you want to get the state of the thread, if you want to suspend the thread, uh, you need the handle to the thread, to the task. And uh, that's exactly what you get when you call the OS thread create. We can uh, or we should check uh, the return value because if it is not null, the thread creation was successful. But if it is null, there was an error. Typically, it would mean that there is not enough memory in the heap to allocate the TCB and stack. So in such case, uh, if you didn't implement the hook functionality, uh, you know that uh, there is a serious error and you can't use this thread. You can still operate your application, but this task wasn't created. Now, uh, the task one handle uh, has got the type of OS thread ID. It is created uh, with this function, with the definition of the thread created by the macro and an argument. You can as well terminate the thread by calling this function with a thread ID. You can as well pass uh, null to delete uh, a current thread. So if you want to uh, terminate yourself, you pass a null or zero and uh, that will find the appropriate value automatically and terminate the current process. You can get the task ID by calling the thread get ID function. So if you need it for other purposes, you can as well obtain it. How to control the behavior of the task? Uh, when uh, you are within a task, uh, you can yield. This means uh, the thread at the current uh, moment will be interrupted and it will cause a task switch. So if another task is waiting, the yield will cause the other task to run. It's a very effective method of uh, not wasting the CPU time if my job is finished. So I don't spend time uh, drinking coffee. I give the microphone to my colleague immediately. That's yielding. You can test if a thread was suspended by calling a thread is suspended with its uh, ID and it will return whether the thread was put into the suspend state or whether it's uh, in other blocked ready running. Uh, you can resume a suspended task. You can check the state of the task. So you can uh, detect whether the task is ready, blocked, suspended. Uh, you can as well resume and suspend all tasks. This is very useful when uh, you want to stop the execution of everything and you, for example, wait for an interrupt to resume. So if you want a lower power mode, you can stop everything. And uh, for example, on a button press that will resume all tasks, you again return to the functionality. 
let's begin another topic, intertask communication. Uh, the tasks uh, don't live uh, alone. It would be a pity if uh, you run independent applications on a microcontroller that couldn't communicate, synchronize, and exchange the data. And uh, if you would need to manage them uh, somehow in a shared memory, it would be a nightmare. That's why the RTOS defines a way how the tasks can exchange the data and different synchronization events. And they can as well fight for a, a limited resource and they can guard the limited resource. So, uh, the common API of the RTOS offers uh, several different elements, like queues that allow to pass information from task to task or from interrupt to task. Semaphores that uh, allow you to specify or uh, to guard uh, a number of resources with a limited amount. There is a possibility to notify a specific task, so you can send a notification event to wake it up. You can as well use mutexes, uh, where several different tasks can try to acquire it, and only the first one who acquires the mutex would be able to continue. And uh, there are as well event groups that can synchronize uh, the operation of the tasks uh, from multiple resources, one of many or all of many. The first uh, I'd like to speak about is a queue. The queue uh, can be uh, expressed as a pipe or a FIFO between different tasks in an RTOS. What you can put in the queue? You can put a number and uh, you can put an object with a bigger size. A number is a 32-bit value and it can be typecasted as a signed and unsigned number and it can be as well used as a pointer. And uh, depending on the queue and uh, its usage, it's on you to interpret the number that you receive because it's uh, transmitted as a union with uh, the signed, unsigned and the pointer. So you choose how you decode and how you use the value. The default functionality of the queue is a FIFO, first in, first out. So if you put the numbers 1, 2 and 3 into the queue, they will be read by default as 1, 2 and 3. The queue, however, allows to change the order of the elements. Because you can as well send uh, the data not at the end of the queue, but to the beginning. So if you have a priority message that needs to be processed first, you can place this message to the beginning of the queue so that the receiving task will take it as a first one. That's a very important thing and uh, very nicely implemented. By the way, uh, the LIFO can be used to using the native API using this function, XQ sent to front. However, it's not implemented in the CMC's RTOS API. So if you need this functionality, you can typecast the CMC's ID of the queue and you can use the native function. There is, however, one thing, the data sent by the queue should be of the same data type and same size. If uh, you put just a number in the queue, we can define it as a standard queue. However, if we want to put uh, a bigger object, like a structure, array, and so on, it has to be defined as a mail. So if you, for example, send strings through the memory, you can put them in an array and send the whole array. But the queue should be defined with the data size of the array, multiplied by number of elements. The length of the queue is declared uh, during definition of the queue, 
So you define how many elements can fit inside. Then the size of the queue in the heap will be defined uh, at the runtime by memory allocation, by malloc. So you define how many elements you fit in the queue. And now how to operate with such queue. So uh, there are a couple of uh, functions and uh, we can see how the objects will react or how the tasks will react when the queue is in use. So let's imagine that uh, we have got one sender task and a receiver task. The sender task will send the messages into the queue using the OS message put function. After it sends the first message with this function, it will be put in the queue to the first place. The receiver task at that moment uh, waits for the message with the function OS message get. So if the sender task in the between sends another message, it's as well put in the queue. And when the receiver task asks for the message, uh, it can get it through the OS message get function. So it will extract the first message from the queue. And then if it uh, waits for another message, it can extract the second message from the queue. So you can see perfect FIFO. First message placed, first message received. Second message placed, second message received. Uh, the queue can be created uh, by uh, OS message create with the message queue definition. So again, the definition has to be made prior calling the OS message create. Then it can be as well allocated to a specific thread, but uh, normally there is null here. You can put the data into queue with the OS message put, with the queue ID, the number to send, the timeout, and uh, it will return the OS status, telling you whether it successfully placed the message into the queue or that there was a timeout putting the message because if the queue is full, if uh, the messages are completely full inside the queue, the sending function doesn't have any place to put a new message. So it can time out if uh, the receiver doesn't take any message out of the queue. And uh, on the other side, the message can be received and it is received and returned through the OS event structure. This structure contains a couple of elements where one of them is the data that can be typecasted as a pointer or a value. And there is as well a status telling whether uh, there was a message received or whether there was a timeout. So again, the OS message get gets a timeout for reception. And uh, if the queue is empty longer than the timeout, so if uh, no, receive, no sender puts the data inside, at that moment, the receiver can timeout and you know there was no communication. So typically, if you expect some periodic message and you timeout on the reception, you know that the communication was cut and there may be, for example, a uh, wire cutting or some damage of the PCB. So this way, the data can be exchanged, the simple data. The queue can be as well deleted with the OS message delete. There is as well a possibility to look inside the queue without removing the message. This is especially useful if uh, you need to decide what to do with the data or if you need to process the data later or pre-process something. You can use the function OS message peak, which will look at the first element in the queue. It will return it, but it will not remove it from the queue. So it means that you can check, hey, is there some data? Is this data for me or not? If not, let's do something else and some other task can take it from the same queue. I didn't mention it, but uh, two or more different tasks can wait for the data from the same queue. So uh, it's interesting 
Uh, if uh, the tasks have the same priority, then the first one that's ready uh, to be uh, launched will get it. If the tasks have different priority, then the one with the higher priority will get the data from the queue. Uh, so this method can be used if, for example, you have uh, several tasks handling uh, uh, web server requests. So in such case, the web server can spawn several different threads and the tasks can operate as the threads providing the data. So if you get a new connection, you put this connection ID to the queue and the task that is available and waits for it can get it. So you can share the load between different tasks and each task can process different things, web page, dynamic script, image, JSON, and so on. Very simply, if all of them wait on the same queue and you give them the new port number to re reply the data on, they can do it. You can as well check uh, uh, how many uh, messages are waiting in the queue and you can check what is the available space. So these functions are uh, exactly opposite. One counts how many are inside and the other counts how many still fit in. When you get uh, the message, uh, it receives uh, or it's received through the OS even structure. You can see uh, the structure with the status inside and a union giving you the value of uh, the data. So either a signed value, a pointer or a set of signals. And there is as well a definition what is the source of the data. So you can even identify who sent you the message. And uh, we can uh, try to uh, launch uh, the example of the queue if you are interested. So please come to the CubeMX and we will expand our project. So now we can uh, uh, come back to our uh, CubeMX project and uh, first uh, we will choose the tasks and queues and uh, we will rename the two tasks to sender one and the receiver. So the first task can be called sender one, the second task can be called a receiver. All right, uh, then in the same dialog box, we can uh, create a queue and we will call it Q1. The item size will be unsigned in eight underscore T, so one unsigned character. And we can put the queue size 256 elements. So this way we are able to send uh, up to 256 bytes inside the queue. And when you press OK, it will instantiate the queue. And uh, when you generate the code later, it will create the queue at the beginning before launching the free Artos. Now, when you look into the generated code, if you uh, click on generate code and uh, come back to Atolic, you shall see that uh, the uh, message queue ID was defined and we have got a new item, Q1 handle. In the main code, you can see that the queue is defined and created, and the Q1 handle is instantiated and filled in. So now we will modify the sender task and uh, we can uh, print F uh, the task one on the screen and in the meantime we can as well put into our queue a number with a timeout. So this way the sender task or sender one task will send the number one to the queue and it will wait uh, one second and it will repeat. So this way the sender one will periodically send a number one into this queue and when we look at the receiver task, 
the receiver task will get the return value from the queue and uh, it will wait, uh, let's say, one second or two seconds to get the data from the queue. Okay, so I hope now it's a little bit uh, more obvious what we should do in the receiver task. So you can see that uh, we are waiting for the message from this queue uh, because the sender task uh, sends the data with a period of one second. We should wait a little bit longer. So here we wait for four seconds and uh, in the next step we print out the value on the screen from the return value with the value and the P. So this way I am able to extract what was sent to the queue and print it to the screen. The queue operations are uh, typically blocking ones. Especially if you put a timeout or you wait forever, uh, when you operate with the queue, when you put a data inside or you get the data out of the queue, uh, these operations are blocking. So if you call an OS message put and uh, the queue is full, so if there is no space, uh, this OS message put uh, will cause the task that calls this function to become blocked for the specific timeout that you define when calling this function. Uh, if uh, any receiver will read from the queue and it will empty it, uh, the sending task will be awakened before the timeout and it can put its message into it. Otherwise, if it times out, it returns the OS timeout and uh, the function failed. So you have to test the return result, whether you were able to put the message into the queue or not. That's for safety of your application to see if the data passed through. The opposite side, a receiver uh, has as well the OS message get blocking. That means if uh, you need to wait for the data in the queue, if the queue was empty, the OS message get will block your task and it will block it either until a message arrives or you get a timeout. Of course, if you put a zero timeout, the function will not wait at all and it just returns event or failed. So right now we can continue with the lab with two senders. So please come back to the cube and uh, create a second sender task. So it should have the same priority like the other two. And uh, speaking about the the sender two, you can effectively create a very similar thing. So right now we can uh, change the behavior of the senders and you can see the bodies of the two functions here. So please create a second sender task, sender two, and uh, adapt the bodies of the two functions this way. So having two senders, will cause that uh, the two different items get into the queue and the receiver task has to receive them. Okay, so now uh, in the next lab, uh, we can uh, increase the priority of the receiver task. So please come back to the CubeMX and uh, double click on the receiver and uh, change the priority from normal to above normal. Then again, you can regenerate the code. If you increase the priority of the receiver, do you still get the expected behavior of your application? Yes. So now the receiver gets unblocked every time you receive new data. And uh, this way, every time one sender sends something, uh, 
the receiver will be awakened immediately afterwards. So additionally, we can create a, a queue with a different data size. This is an, again a very interesting example because now uh, with this uh, you can send objects with a bigger size. So if we come uh, back to the Cubemix uh, and uh, looking into the queue definition, I'd probably ask you to create a queue number uh, two, so Q2. And uh, this one will have uh, the queue size 16 and the item size will be called data. This will generate arbitrary code that will uh, take the data as a data size. So we will need a type def to the data. And uh, this we need to generate manually. So when you again generate uh, a code with the uh, new queue, please uh, define in the private defines of uh, the main file, the data structure with this definition type def structure and inside there will be a 16-bit value and 8-bit source and the structure will be called data. We can as well define two different uh, initialized variables with these contents. Okay, so once we have got uh, our uh, data structure defined, uh, you can see that uh, sending the data uh, through the queue handle, uh, we can uh, put a pointer to the data that we defined. And uh, by typecasting it uh, to the appropriate data type, we can put these data inside the message. So technically, we send a pointer to the global variable. And now, when we receive such data, instead of uh, the data itself, uh, we will receive a pointer so in the receiver, we can uh, test if we received the appropriate value. And for the sources, we can typecast the pointers to the data the pointer type. And we can reference it and take the value from the structure. So this is one way of uh, passing uh, bigger data structures. But it's not very efficient because it keeps pointer in the memory. If you want to pass uh, bigger data with their content, because passing just the pointer it may not be very efficient because when the original sending task uh, already tries to modify these data, it can overwrite in the meantime the content that you process in the receiver task. So if you want to put the complete content into the queue, so send uh, the snapshot and receive a snapshot, while the sender can start operating on the original buffer or variable, we can use a mail. A mail is a little bit different because it uh, doesn't give you only a space for a pointer, but it uh, defines the list of the items in the format of a chunk of memory multiplied by number of elements. So if you, for example, are used to send uh, strings with 100 characters, you can define a mail for 10 strings, 100 characters each, or 101 for the termination. So this way, you can send as much as 10 strings, but you will need more than one kilobyte of your memory. So uh, using queues, and mails both have benefits. Mails take a snapshot and the content inside the mail, but you need to allocate a lot of RAM. However, the queues take only a pointer, but you need to maintain the original content until the receiver processes that. So it's your choice whether you are able to wait with the new data until the receiver processes them so that you can release them or 
you need a mail where you send the full content of the message but uh, the transmitter can use the same buffer for preparing a new message in between so speaking about mails they have got uh, their own api and uh, they are as well defined in the cube mix in a separate uh, dialog box or tab so you can create a mail queue with the queue definition you can put a mail inside and uh, here there is a pointer to the mail message but uh, because the mail knows how long the mail item is it takes the content and copies it inside the mail structure and you can as well uh, release the mail from the memory and remove it completely from the heap you can uh, create uh, and allocate the space for the mail so uh, using the os mail alloc uh, i'm giving a mail queue handle and uh, a waiting time with a, within milliseconds and uh, you can as well clear the newly created mail to zero the mail api is allocated here and the appropriate uh, rtos api on the right side